Once again, it is a joy for me to be here, and I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to uh, teach and preach, and I appreciate uh, your presence here tonight for our study. Quick word, if I may be permitted, uh, concerning uh, my Peggy. I think I've mentioned before that she'd been diagnosed with uh, dementia. The doctor told us that uh, there are seven stages and that she is currently or was currently back in May at the ending uh, portion of stage six and beginning of stage seven, but she'd been able to maintain her physical strength until last Thursday. <laughs> I woke up about five o'clock in the morning. She's on her knees on the floor on her side of the bed and uh, I just assumed that she slid out or rolled out of bed and landed on her knees instead of her feet but she couldn't get up I don't know how long she'd been there but I helped her get up she was wobbly but we got her dressed and took her out to the kitchen got her some breakfast and then she went in and laid down on the couch and I went and did some other things, came back a little later, and she's on the floor again, second time. Rolled off or fell off the couch. Uh, apparently didn't bruise anything or hurt anything, but uh, couldn't get up again. So I got her up and eventually got her out to the kitchen again, fixed her some lunch. Again, she went back in the afternoon to lay down on the couch. And uh, I went... <laughs> This is more work on one of the other rooms. Came back out later in the afternoon. Third time, she's on the floor again. <laughs> I called the doctor, and it was too late because I was calling over to Dayton, and they're, of course, different time zone. They'd already closed, but I got her in to see the doctor the next morning, about 10 o'clock Friday morning. They determined that she had a uh, urinary tract infection. And apparently that threw her for a real loop here. Uh, made her real weak, said she was dehydrated, running a fever. So we got her some medication to take care of the infection and uh, some pills to get the fever down and been feeding her a lot of uh, juice to drink, try to keep her hydrated. And she bounced back pretty good uh, Friday and Saturday, she was almost back to normal. This morning, her temperature's normal, so we're glad for that, but I would like to request that you keep her in your prayers. Uh, the dementia is not going to get any better. Matter of fact, it'll probably progressively get worse, but uh, hopefully she'll be able to maintain her strength as long as possible, although that, I think, gradually is supposed to go uh, as time progresses. But uh, just part of, I guess, growing old, and that's what we're doing <laughs> every day, <laughs> uh, no matter what our age, another day older. But we do appreciate uh, the prayers on uh, her behalf and all of these others that were mentioned. Almost, we were kind of embarrassed to tell you about my problems since you got a whole number of them here already. <laughs> Tonight want to deal with the question that is often, quite often asked of members of the Lord's Church as to why we do not use instrumental music in our worship. The Baptist, if you go to a Baptist church, is going to have instrumental music. You go to a Methodist church, and they're going to have instruments of music. You go to a Presbyterian church, and they're going to have an instrument of music or more. You go to a Catholic church and they're going to have instrumental music. Matter of fact, just about any and every church you attend is going to have instrumental music. But when people attend the church of Christ, one of the first things they notice is that we do not have an instrument, mechanical instrument of music to use in our worship services. We just sing. We have a cappella singing, as we call it. And they often think uh, we're a little bit peculiar for that reason. And uh, many religious
religious people today tend to think that the churches of Christ are a little strange, perhaps peculiar, and the Bible does say we're to be a peculiar people, but <laughs> most people don't use that term the way the Bible does anymore. But they think we're peculiar because we oppose instruments of music. At one time, they thought maybe we just couldn't afford a piano or an organ, <laughs> which was not really the case. But uh, when they found out we are opposed to it, then they think we really are peculiar. And most of these people would be shocked to learn that some of our greatest scholars of ages gone by, including some of their own religious leaders and founders, took exactly the same position as churches of Christ do to this day. In fact, there was a time when the instrument was a definite newcomer to religious services just about across the board. And although it has become commonplace now in most denominations, this was not always the case. So churches of Christ probably seem rather odd to non-members when they visit because that's the first thing as we said most of them notice that there's the absence of a piano or an organ or other instruments of music and to members of the church there's nothing unusual about congregational singing rather than a uh, robed choir that will sing to you and uh, where the members don't participate in singing uh, like we do uh, when we have a cappella singing and music. Members of Churches of Christ are more likely to think that any other practice is odd, including especially the loud instrumental uh, music that is sometimes almost more like a rock band today than it is a worship uh, uh, part or part of the worship. And uh, when you go to the Bible, there is not a single example of any of this in the New Testament. There's a complete absence. Matter of fact, there are some one dozen passages, and I didn't make the list out to go over with you, but you can look those up, that deal with the subject of uh, music, uh, as we would call it, in worship. But the New Testament doesn't use that term music, except uh, when it's talking about music and dancing or something like that. But every single time it's talking about what is done in the worship of the Lord's church. It's always singing. They uh, sang a hymn, or they have already sung, or they're to speak to themselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and make melody in their heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. So not a single New Testament Christian, think about this, ever heard the sound of an instrument of music in the worship of the church that was established on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So why is that the case? Why did the early church not use instruments of music? Why do we today still insist that we will not use instruments of music in our worship? Well, we could answer that basically in a short word and just say it's not authorized. But uh, that's a little uh, uh, less than what we want to say about it tonight. But before we get into the reasons, and I want to end up giving you three reasons, biblical reasons why, we do not use instruments of music in worship. Before we do that, I want to give you some history. And I think this is informative as well as interesting. So before we get to the question of what the New Testament says, let's look at some religious scholars and teachers and leaders and see what they have had to say and what they have done in the past. Back in 1911, a book was published entitled, this was done by a member of the church by the name of M.C. Curfies, and it's entitled Instrumental Music in Worship. So we said that was published in 1911. In that book, he quotes from another man, John Spencer Kerwin, 
who was a member of the Royal Academy of Music in London. And here's what he quoted that man as saying. Men still living, this was 1911, men still living can remember the time when organs were very seldom found outside the Church of England. The Methodists, Independents, and Baptists rarely had them, and the Presbyterians were stoutly opposed to them. Now that quotation from a credible historian, uh, he lived around 1880, certainly raises a very interesting thought. We learn that just before the turn of that century, organs were rarely used by the Methodists, the Baptists, and the Presbyterians, who today, especially members of those denominations, who would have thought that was the case? People today who are members of those denominations have always had an instrument of music in their worship. They've never known anything else. So uh, uh, probably they would be very shocked and surprised to learn uh, this little bit about their history. Uh, Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodists uh, at first did not use them. And to verify this information, let's take some closer looks. First of all, from James W. McKinnon, who was a Roman Catholic scholar. Now, McKinnon wrote a Ph.D. dissertation, that's a doctor of philosophy, uh, the highest level you can go in, uh, in uh, obtaining uh, those uh, uh, degrees. He did this in 1965 at the uh, Columbia University on the subject of the church fathers and musical instruments. And although McKinnon was a Catholic, he did not write his dissertation from a religious perspective. The dissertation is a scholarly historical treatise on the attitude of the what are known as the church fathers uh, in the early centuries after Christ. He points out that not only did the early writers oppose the use of instruments, but also the simple fact was and is, and this is a direct quote, he said they were not used in the patristic period. Now that's the period uh, following the establishment of the first century church. Now we're second, third, fourth centuries. If musical instruments had been used in the first century church, then certainly uh, there would have been uh, uh, no opposition to them in the second, third, and fourth. But there was, and there is. As Everett Ferguson, one of our own brethren, has observed, according to the New Testament evidence, instrumental music was not present in the worship of the early church. Now, many of you may have uh, a set of commentaries by Adam Clark. Uh, he's very well known uh, for his uh, Old Testament commentaries. His uh, specialty was Hebrew language. And of course, that's what the Old Testament was originally written in. Clark was a Methodist, very noted Methodist minister, who lived from 1762 to 1832. And as I said, many students, even today, I have a set of his commentaries on both the Old and the New Testament. I wouldn't recommend him, of course, on the New, but uh, his Old Testament commentary is very, very good at times. But it's a remarkable tribute to him that uh, writing that commentary, it is still in print uh, more than... Uh, few hundred years after his death. But here's what he had to say in his commentary about the use of instrumental music. I'm quoting. He said, The whole spirit, soul, and genius of the Christian religion are against this. And that's a reference to the use of instruments of music. He said, Those who know the church of God best 
and what constitutes its genuine spiritual state know that these things have been introduced as a substitute for the life and power of religion and that where they prevail most there is the least of the power of Christianity. So then he said, away with such portentous baubles from the worship of that infinite spirit who requires his followers to worship him in spirit and in truth. For to know such worship are those instruments friendly. Now those are found in his comments on Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25. He went on to say, I'm an old man and an old minister. And I here declare that I never knew them, that is, musical instruments, productive of any good in the worship of God, and have reason to believe they were productive of much evil. Music is a science, he said, I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. That is the abuse of music. And so he said, here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. Those uh, quotations come from his comments on Amos chapter 6 and verse 5, where Amos pronounced a woe upon those that are at ease in Zion and also upon those who invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Next, we turn to John Wesley. John Wesley is recognized as the founder of the Methodist Church. He lived from 1703 to 1791. And there's a statement by Wesley, which we probably would never have known had it not been for his fellow churchman and admirer, Adam Clark. Remember I said Adam Clark was a Methodist. Well, John Wesley was the man who began the Methodist Church. When Clark expressed his own views, which we just quoted to you, about the impropriety of instrumental music and worship, which by the way he called sinful and without sanction and against the will of God, he also gave a quotation from John Wesley. He said this, The late, venerable, and most eminent divine the Reverend John Wesley, notice he's using denominational terminology here, <clears throat> he said he was a lover of music and an elegant poet. <clears throat> and he said when he was asked his opinion of instruments of music being introduced into the chapels of the, of the Methodists, he said in his terse and powerful manner, and here's the quote that Clark gives, I have no objections to instruments of music in our chapels, provided they are neither heard nor seen. <laughs> that pretty well sums it up. John Calvin is another one we want to look at. He is the founder of the Presbyterian Church. He lived from 1509 to 1564. And he is decidedly one of the most influential theologians who's ever lived. He wrote... Uh, a series of books, volumes of books, called the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And he did not originate the doctrine that is known as Calvinism, but what he did was systematize it into what are known as the five points of Calvinism. Those five points are usually uh, taught to people by use of the word TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. That is an acrostic. The T stands for total hereditary depravity. The U stands for unconditional predestination. The Bible does teach predestination, but not unconditional predestination. Predestination in the Bible is conditional. The word L stands for limited atonement, the idea that Christ did not die for everyone, only the elect. The I stands for irresistible grace, the idea that when... Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and works on your heart. You cannot resist those efforts. And if he wants to convert you, uh, you're going to be converted. But uh, that goes right along with the idea of unconditional predestination, that some have been predestined to be saved, 
Those are the ones the Holy Spirit will convert, he says. And others have been uh, predestined to be lost. And uh, nothing can be done by them or for them. And finally, that last letter P stands for the perseverance of the saints. But you'll find that doctrine has infiltrated almost every major denomination in our land today. Presbyterians believe it, Methodists, the Baptists, uh, many others uh, advocate either one or more ideas of, uh, of Calvinism. Sometimes they don't... Uh, subscribe to all five points uh, just as uh, for instance here you'll sometimes see and I didn't look uh, past a Baptist church on the way to this building I didn't look but many Baptist churches will have the sign that says free will Baptist church well that's telling you they don't believe that man has lost his freedom of will Calvin did believe that and so sometimes they don't subscribe to all points of Calvinism, but most of them do. Well, Calvin's view on instrumental music is expressed in his commentary on the 33rd Psalm. He said, Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, and the restoration of other shadows of the law. All of the things that he just mentioned there, the instruments of music, those were used in Old Testament times, but they also burned incense, and uh, they also lit lamps, especially the one inside the uh, tabernacle in the holy place, and uh, he said the restoration of other shadows of the law. In the Hebrew letter, chapter 10, you're going to read that the law was a shadow of good things to come. Well, that old law of Moses has been replaced by the better law of Christ. So we have the old covenant that's been done away. We now live under the new covenant. And under the covenant of Christ, he was saying instruments of music should not be uh, used and burning of incense should not be used. Lighting of lamps should not be used. That was all part of the covenant that was done away. And it's not part of the new covenant of Christ. But again, most Presbyterians probably don't know that Calvin held that view. Then there's a, pre a Presbyterian professor by the name of John L. Gerardo. Professor at Columbia Theological Seminary in South Carolina who wrote a book entitled Instrumental Music in Public Worship. This was first published back in 1888. In that book, he made an exceedingly strong case against the use of instruments of music in worship. As Calvin did before him, Gerardo contended that instrumental music was a shadow of the law. And here's what he said, and I'm quoting. We are Christians and we are untrue to Christ and to the Spirit of Grace when we resort to the abrogated and forbidden ritual of the Jewish temple. Now we turn to the Baptists. One of the greatest Baptist preachers, that is according to most Baptists, to ever live was a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon. He was a man that lived from 1834 to 1892. As I said, he's regarded even to this day as one of the greatest Baptist preachers to ever live. He was the minister of the largest, at the time anyway, largest Baptist church in the world. He would preach to thousands each week at the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle in London, England. His books and sermons are still widely printed and circulated today. One of his greatest literary compositions was a six-volume set of commentaries on the Psalms, which he called the Treasury of David. I have a computer app that's called eSword, but you'll find this probably in any other uh, 
Bible application that you can have on your computer or your phone, uh, most of those applications are going to have Spurgeon's comments in his treasury of David on the uh, subject of the Psalms. Uh, they just automatically include that as, as part, of that, uh, part of that app. But here's what he said uh, in his commentary. I'm quoting again. He said, David appears to have had a peculiar, tender remembrance of the singing of the pilgrims. And assuredly, it is the most delightful part of worship and that which comes nearest to the adoration of heaven. What a degradation to supplant the intelligent song of the whole congregation by the theatrical prettiness of a quartet the refined niceties of a choir, or the blowing off of the wind from inanimate bellows and pipes. We might as well pray by machinery as praise by it. End of quote. Still on the Baptists. Three of the greatest names in the field of Baptist history are Thomas Armitage, Henry C. Vetter and David Benedict. Uh, and if you ever read uh, any of the debates that our brethren have had with Baptists, usually these books are going to be quoted from by both sides of the debate. The Baptists like to quote from them, and of course we like to quote and show uh, what the Baptists really do teach and then refute that and show why it was wrong. But in uh, writing uh, his books on uh, the history of the Baptist Church, he wrote one called 50 Years Among the Baptists. And in that work, he revealed some startling information regarding the attitude of the Baptist in former times uh, concerning instruments of music and worship. He said this, Staunch old Baptists in former times would as soon have tolerated the Pope of Rome in their pulpits as an organ in their galleries. And yet the instrument has gradually found its way among them and their successors in church management with nothing like the jars and difficulties which arose of old concerning the uh, bass, viol, and smaller instruments of music. Now very few Baptists today would realize that Charles Spurgeon once said we might as well pray by machinery as praised by it as he opposed instruments of music. Even fewer would recognize that there was a time when the old Baptists would have as soon invited the Pope of Rome into their pulpits as to have an instrument music or instrument of music in their worship. And as the historian said, Benedict, it gradually found its way among them. A host of Baptists would doubtlessly be shocked today to learn that the churches of Christ are still maintaining the position that the old Baptists once believed with all their heart. So, after viewing all of this, you find out in reality the way we worship is not so strange, not so peculiar as it turns out. Uh, historical data supports the conclusion that musical instruments were not used in New Testament worship. They were not introduced into the religious services until many, many years later. And some of the most celebrated religious leaders and thinkers in history have been adamantly opposed to their use and worship. The statement of musical historian John Spencer Kerwin, which we cited earlier, now is much more understandable. Remember he said the Methodists, the Independents, and the Baptists rarely had them, that is instruments of music, by the Presbyterians. They were stoutly opposed. Well, it appears then that several religious denominations did in fact reject instrumental music in worship in their early history. But gradually, 
They adopted it so that most of their members today just take it for granted. They assume it's always been that way, when in reality it is not. In other words, they don't know their own history. But we can't really criticize that because some of our people don't know our own history as well as they should. And that's one of the reasons I appreciate being able to deliver some of these lessons on restoration. People today are so accustomed to the use of instrumental music in worship that they just suppose the churches of Christ have taken a novel approach to the matter without once recognizing that it is the churches of Christ who are actually taking the ancient approach as found among New Testament churches of the first century and then the documented practice for hundreds of years thereafter. That's some history. But as compelling as the historical evidence is against the use of instrumental music in worship, it's not really the reason why churches of Christ do not use instruments of music. So, let's look at three biblical reasons why we do not use instrumental music in our worship. Number one, we cite the authority principle. 1 Peter 4.11, Peter made the statement, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And Jesus said in John 4.24, We are to worship God. Matter of fact, he said we must worship God in spirit and in truth. The point is that man is not at liberty to select the form of worship which appeals to him or to adopt it because it is culturally pleasing. Everett Ferguson has said, Worship is what man offers to God. The important thing in Christian worship is not our uplift, or what pleases our senses, or what we find uh, aesthetically satisfying. Instrumental music may put one in a certain mood, it may stir his heart. It may even stimulate high sentiments, as well as some lower or lesser ones. But he said one's feelings are not to determine his worship. Instrumental music performed by someone else cannot be something that we offer to God. So the thesis offered here is that although worship may have some aspects which are emotional or aesthetic. It may appeal to the senses in uh, what the person believes to be a good way. It is not to be determined by these aspects, but by what is rational and spiritual and verbal. In other words, that speak as the oracles of God, as Peter said to worship God in spirit and in truth. Worship has to be grounded in man's relation to God as creature and creator. That means man must come before God on God's terms when he comes to worship him. Thus the Apostle Paul laid down this law found in Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Notice the word all or everything, whatsoever you do, in word, that's what we teach, or in deed, that's what we practice. All of those things must be done in the name of or by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what that phrase means. You might recall the Lord's statement in uh, Matthew 28, uh, 19 and 20, when he said, All authority, actually verse 18 to start with, All authority hath been given unto me. Some versions will say, All power hath been given unto me. The Lord has all authority. And he has to authorize what we do in our worship. And so Paul said, Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of or by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. 
To do something in a person's name is to act by that person's authority. For instance, if somebody knocks on your door and says, open up in the name of the law, they're saying simply, you need to open up, I'm demanding that you do so, by the authority that has been vested in me as a law officer. So to worship God in spirit and in truth uh, has to be done by God's authority. And the simple truth is this. There is no divine authority for instrumental music in New Testament worship. There's plenty of authority for singing, but none, absolutely none, there is for instrumental music. There's no command for it. There's no example of it. There's no record of it in all of the scriptures. Past that, there is no support for it in uh, early history, the first few centuries. There's no mention of it in the religious services for hundreds of years after the New Testament era. So if you believe in the authority principle, and you have to if you believe the Bible, the conviction that we must have divine authority for what we do in worship, then there simply is no place for the use of musical instruments in sacred worship. That's the authority principle. That is violated by adding instruments of music to the worship of the Lord's church. Secondly, there's the pattern principle. God has given us a pattern for our work and our worship. Thus, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13, Paul admonished Timothy to hold fast the form of sound words. That's King James reading. American Standard says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Then in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, that same apostle stated, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now since Timothy was obligated to commit to others what he heard from Paul, and since Paul delivered what delivered to him what he called a pattern of sound words, it's clear that the pattern was supposed to be transmitted from generation to generation, even to the end of time. Paul taught Timothy. Timothy was to teach others. They in turn were to pass along what they learned so that the pattern could be kept alive wherever men followed the inspired word of God. Now just stop and think. If there is no pattern, then the New Testament means nothing or little to us today. Oh, I guess we could read it for poetry. We could uh, say it inspires us. We might even say it gives us comfort. But we would not be required to follow it. We would not be required to obey it. We would not be required to abide by it. But that's exactly the attitude that most religious people have today. That you don't need to uh, follow it. You don't need to obey it. You don't need to abide by it. Whatever you want to do, uh, as long as you're sincere, they say that's fine. But that's wrong. It seems very certain that the New Testament writers recognized that their message came from God. Matter of fact, Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 14.37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So if we acknowledge the scriptures as a pattern, then we must follow that pattern as a divine model. And when we look to the New Testament pattern for worship, you cannot find instruments of music as a part of that design. The Bible only authorizes five specific acts of worship. Sing, pray, give, observe the Lord's Supper, and have teaching or preaching. And it's presumptuous on our part 
to add to, or in some cases, subtract from that pattern. And yet that again is what uh, many religions have done. Thirdly, there is the restoration principle. Churches of Christ subscribe to the restoration principle. We believe it is our duty, responsibility to restore New Testament Christianity in this present age. And the restoration principle really grows out of the pattern principle. For if God has given a pattern for us to follow, and we believe that he has, then we must restore the teaching and practice of the Lord's church to conform to God's pattern. One of the reasons that we sometimes appoint elders in the church today is simply because there were elders in the New Testament church. When Paul was uh, working on his missionary journeys, in Acts 14, 23, you'll read that he appointed elders in every church, in every city. And in Titus 1, verses 5 to 9, he sets forth qualifications those men had to meet in order to be appointed as elders. Well, when you look out men and examine them for those qualifications and find that they meet those qualifications and then you appoint them as elders over a local congregation, that's simply following the restoration principle and the restoration pattern. Thus we are seeking to restore the pattern of New Testament uh, organization so that the church today will match the church of the first century in every essential detail. Now, I notice I said essential. The reason we do not worship, for instance, or venerate Mary like the Catholics do, or make the sign of the cross like they do, or burn incense like they do, and if you've ever seen a Catholic funeral, you've all seen all three of those things, is simply because we do not find any of these practices in the New Testament church. And we are endeavoring to restore or to duplicate the New Testament order of things. It should be clear, therefore, that one reason we do not use instrumental music in worship is simply because we do not find it in the New Testament church. And you can't restore that which was never there. J.W. McGarvey once said regarding instrumental music, it is manifest that we cannot adopt the practice, that is the use of instruments of music, without abandoning the obvious and only ground on which a restoration of primitive Christianity can be accomplished, or on which the plea for it can be maintained. He said, such is my profound conviction, and consequently the question with me is not one concerning the choice or rejection of an expedient but the maintenance or abandonment of a fundamental and necessary principle. So to sum all of this up, we do not use instrumental music in worship simply because there is no divine authority for its usage in the worship of the New Testament church. It is a departure from the pattern of worship that God has given and it represents an abandonment of the plea to restore New Testament Christianity in the present age. Consequently, it violates the authority principle, the pattern principle, and the restoration principle. And for all of these reasons, we claim it is wrong and sinful. Now, earlier I said something about uh, essential details. You need to bear in mind that the use of instrumental music is not just a mere incidental matter, such as electric lights, uh, or songbooks, or even a public uh, address system uh, would be or is. Efforts are sometimes made to place the instrument of music in the same category with these other things. But an electric light is not an act of worship. <laughs> Singing is, praying is, observing the Lord's Supper is, giving is, preaching is, but turning an electric light on is not an act of worship. And most people 
should be able to see that just using plain old common sense. The instrument, however, is an addition to our worship. And every act of worship must, as we've said, be divinely authorized. The use of instrumental music would be comparable to venerating Mary or saying the rosary. Those are additional acts of worship, but not mere physical surroundings that are not a part of the worship itself. So those who utilize musical instruments in worship have to bear the responsibility of departing from God's divine pattern, acting without scriptural authority, and forsaking the restoration plea. Problem is, most churches today are not interested in restoring New Testament Christianity. They basically have the idea that we want to give the people whatever they want and whatever they desire. But the real question should be, what does God want? What does God desire? And he desires that we sing and not use instrumental music in addition to that. So that's what we do. And as we've learned from history, we're not as strange and peculiar as some people uh, have thought that we might be. Now going back to the authority principle and the pattern principle and the restoration principle. All of those things can be applied also to the question that was often asked in the Bible as in Acts 16 verse 30 when the jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? God has spoken authoritatively in answer to that question. He has given a pattern that we are to follow that we simply call the steps of salvation. And uh, if we're going to restore New Testament Christianity, we have to restore this pattern of an answer that is given in the Bible in answer to that question, what must I do to be saved? We mentioned there are five acts of worship. There are likewise also five points in the plan of salvation. Number one, a person has to hear. Uh, you can't please God without faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us that. But Romans 10 17 tells us faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. So the first thing a person has to hear or do is hear the gospel of Christ. That's why we've been commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Secondly, when they hear it, they are then commanded to obey it. The Lord would say, John 8, 24, Except ye believe that I am he, that is the Messiah, ye shall die in your sins. And then he added, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So they have to hear. Then they have to believe the gospel of Christ. That gospel basically has three facts about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Those are facts that must be believed. And so then we are called upon to make a confession of the fact that we do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the same confession you can read in Acts 8 verse 37 when the man from Ethiopia was requesting baptism but he hadn't yet made the good confession. So Philip said, if thou believest, thou mayest, that is, be baptized. And so that man said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And based upon that simple confession of faith, Philip baptized that man in water for the remission of his sins. So a person has to hear, believe, confess, have to also repent of sins. Always. God requires repentance. Acts 17, 30, and 31. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And the Lord said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And so they hear, they believe, they repent, they confess. They're not yet a child of God. One more step. That is the command to be baptized. When Peter was at the household of Cornelius, Acts 10, 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. 
Peter did the same thing in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when he said, uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. There's that phrase again, or by the authority of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And he promised that they would receive the gift of uh, the Holy Ghost. Then he said, The promise is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, that gets us even today. So that is the pattern that is given for all time. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. But then they must continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, Acts 2.41. And if you don't do that, then again, you'll need to repent of your sin. You'll need to confess those sins and ask God for pardon. And it will grant uh, pardon. That's a promise made in 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our iniquities. And if you need to do either one of those things, be baptized or be restored to God's fellowship tonight, we would invite and encourage you to make that known while we stand and sing.